Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Malejac. I am the Secretary General of PIARC, the World Road Association. And I am very happy to be with you today for our webinar on the COVID-19 crisis and uh, how road authorities and road operators and the whole road community uh, handles it. Um, our agenda today is looking very interesting. We will start with a brief introduction to PIARC and to the issues that are faced in general by road operators and uh, administrations. Then we will have four presentations and four presenters. Then this will be followed by a question and answer session. And then of course, next steps and conclusion. Our speakers today come from China, Hongbing, uh, from Mexico, Hector, uh, from Malaysia, Denis, and from Mexico, from a different point of view. Roberto, uh, thank you very much to our panelists for having made themselves uh, available today. Please let me remind you to turn off your microphones and the cameras. Uh, this is because it makes the whole webinar much smoother, a much smoother experience uh, for all uh, participants. Nevertheless, you are very welcome to ask a question, to raise an issue or to share your practice in your country or your organization. This is indeed encouraged, really. Uh, please use the chat feature of Zoom. It usually is at the bottom right of the main window and send a message to all participants uh, rather than just to one participant. Uh, all, all questions that are specific to roads and road transport are welcome questions about uh, the virus in general, well, that's not really what we will focus about. That chat channel is monitored by Christos Xenophontos uh, from Rhode Island DOT in the USA. Christos is the chair of one of our IAC committees. Christos will, will monitor the questions he, and he will raise the questions to the most relevant panelists during the Q&A session. And you can ask such questions anytime. About your name in Zoom, uh, we recommend that participants name themselves accurately in a Zoom application, for example, first name, last name, country, because this really well, fosters interaction between participants. If we know who we are talking with, it makes life much easier for everyone. The session is being recorded. The resulting video will be shared on our website uh, and the PowerPoint slides will also be shared in French, English and Spanish as a PDF file. Uh, let me share with you this disclaimer. Uh, time is of the essence, it's a crisis, uh, and it's likely that knowledge and practice that are going, that's going to be shared with you today has not been officially approved by each country's official authorities. They are presented here today for illustration only. Uh, they do not necessarily represent official policy. They will be subject to further evaluation, and we, we will use them in PR uh, in deriving recommendations on policy and practice. In due course, uh, care has been taken in the preparation of this material, obviously, but we cannot accept any responsibility for any damage that may be caused. In other words, as, as we sometimes say, use at your own risk. Having said that, we strongly believe that those examples are extremely relevant to uh, many countries around the world because what works in one country may also be relevant for, for, for your country, or maybe not, but uh, uh, we trust that everyone will be able to use their common sense. A key concept indeed is to focus on the short term. The, uh, um, uh, the concept is going through a crisis and every day counts. So it's important to share knowledge and current practice between PIAC members in order to support responses to the pandemic in near real time. Such knowledge and current practice are not yet confirmed sometimes as valid or effective, and what works in some parts of the world may or may not be relevant elsewhere. But inspiration can be found anywhere. And a good idea that you would hear today, that you would judge as a good idea for your own case, could help you save lives, could help you improve business resilience, and could help you minimize disruption of services. In parallel, at PIARC, we are planning medium and long-term actions uh, for when the pandemic is, an, is in, a, in a manageable state and under control. Uh, the way we operate is we have set up a, a response team. Uh, my colleagues are here on the screen. Uh, we have agreed uh, terms of reference uh, with our authorities within PIOC. 
And I'm very, very grateful to all those colleagues for having uh, well agreed uh, to work with us uh, almost uh, on a daily basis, actually, and to have uh, set up those webinars and uh, other actions that will be presented uh, in the uh, conclusion today. So the agenda structure was presented uh, already. Uh, the speakers will introduce themselves. I will start with a, or rather continue, uh, with a presentation of PIARC. So PIARC is the new name of the World Road Association. Uh, we were founded in 1909, more than 110 years ago, uh, actually now, as a non-profit, non-political association. Our goal is to organize exchange of knowledge on all matters related to roads and road transport. And this is what we are doing today in this webinar. We have four key missions to be a leading forum for analysis and discussion of any topic related to roads and road transport. We organize general assembly meetings, council meetings, uh, committee meetings, uh, sessions, congresses, uh, etc. To identify and disseminate best practice, this is what we do when we publish, prepare and publish reports on all these topics. On average, we publish one report per month. We consider within our activities the needs of low and middle income countries, sometimes called developing countries. The way we do that is we make sure to take into account their needs in our plans of activity. We involve them in technical committees because their expertise matters to everyone else. And we organize seminars in those countries. This means that PIARC addresses the needs of every country, high income country, high income countries or low and middle income countries. And the fourth mission is to design and pr produce tools for decision making on matters related to roads and uh, road transport. You may be familiar with HDM4, for example. Uh, PIARC is really heavily involved in, in that software or Curan uh, for European, uh, for tunnels in Europe, uh, mostly. The way we do that is to mobilize the expertise of our members. We have 124 member countries uh, at this stage. We have more than 2,500 uh, 2, uh, members, individual members, organizations, universities, etc. And we have 1,000 experts mobilized in about 20 technical committees. They are, they are volunteers and they devote their time, their expertise, their willingness to share best practice so that the best information is identified, explained, presented, uh, and then shared with, uh, with everyone. Our operations are guided by a work plan, which we call a strategic plan. It's a four-year strategic plan. It has just started, and our committee members have just started, well, a few months ago now, uh, uh, working towards the next uh, delivery goals. So what are the issues faced by world operators and administrations uh, in those uh, crisis times? We have decided to structure the situation around six key issues. Those issues were presented more in depth in previous webinars, and you can find them uh, on our website. Uh, issue number one is that you need to ensure your employees' health and safety in general. That, that's true of every organization in the world. This is true for road operators and road administrations as well. And it applies in particular to customer facing uh, uh, staff members, toll booth operators, for example, people who, works, who work on, on work zones. On, on roadworks. Issue number two is you need to maintain activity and, and uh, the continuity of your business. This means that nevertheless, even if some employees are not working as they usually do or are working from home, you need those roads to, to be open. And this implies that you need to be able to find contractors, find material. You need to be able to, uh, to make sure that the contracts are, are working. Uh, all those questions. Issue number three, well, the crisis has an impact on transportation, and this has an impact on you. In many countries, we have seen a strong reduction, maybe 90% in some cases, of traffic on roads. This has meant a sharp decrease in revenue as well. Uh, transportation needs have changed in some countries, very low individual vehicles traffic levels, but higher truck uh, uh, delivery uh, traffic in some cases. Fourth issue is about business relations. Well, you have customers, you have uh, providers, you have partners. You need to make sure that all of them are working together and you need to make sure that you are working with police, opera police operators, security forces, and uh, to be, you need to keep aware of uh, latest developments and recommendations. 
and you need to make sure that those contracts that you have with them will serve as a good uh, basis for those relations. PPP contracts in particular are quite complex and there might be force majeure cases or, or, or well, pandemic uh, situations in many cases were not planned, but you need to use all those provisions. Issue number six is about security. Well, we've seen with terror attacks in some countries, uh, not recently, uh, fortunately, that security has become a strong issue in the world sector as well. Currently, we are facing cyber security issues and cyber attacks, and this is uh, all the more relevant since many of us are now working from home. So I invite you to check the recordings of our previous webinars if you want to know more about those issues and they will be discussed here. Actually, uh, a first note of synthesis is available. It presents the findings from the first four webinars. Those are relevant for the world community and may be useful to inform planning and operational decisions that you have to make on the ground urgently. That note is available from our website, uh, pr.org. It's available for free in English, Spanish and French. And uh, again, thank you to the response team, and in particular to those members who, who well, wrote uh, this note. So this will be all for me. Uh, thank you very much. Don't hesitate and ask questions in the chat uh, channel. Christos is uh, looking at that. And having said that, now is the time uh, for our colleague uh, from uh, China to uh, uh, present the situation in Wuhan, no less, and uh, in his company in particular. Hongbing, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, I'm here, Patrick. Thank you. Um, um, I'm very pleased. Hello, everyone. I'm very pleased to be here uh, to uh, talk about myself and MBC's experience amid the COVID-19 pandemic fight. My name uh, is Xie Hongbin, come from Wuhan, China, and um, I'm a member of uh, uh, PIAC Task Force 3.1. And uh, uh, on the bottom side is the head, our head office, MBEC. Uh, MBEC is the company I'm working. Uh, myself, I'm serving a deputy chief engineer of uh, uh, the company. I'm in charge of uh, overseas market. Uh, I have uh, 32 years of working experience, uh, basically 10 years as designer and 10 years as a, as a client uh, for Hong Kong True Hammer Cowbridge and uh, the rest 12 years uh, I'm working for contract uh, to do the construction. Uh, next, please. Patrick, please, next, yes. MBC is short for China Railway Major Bridge Engineering Group Corporation Limited. This is a fully state-owned company, uh, belong to CREC, China Railway Engineering Group. Uh, we, last year, CREC was ranked as a 55th place of Fortune uh, 500. Uh, what MBS is doing, let me elaborate with this sketch. On the right side, you can see uh, uh, these two are the longest river in China, uh, namely Wuhan Yangtze River, uh, namely uh, Yangtze River and the Yellow River. And if you ask the question, um, when was the first bridge ever built on this river? Right now, there are 150 bridges being built. So this was it. Uh, the Wuhan Yangtze River Bridge uh, started construction started in 1953 and uh, completed in 1957. And uh, since then, MBC was set up. So up to now, we have built uh, uh, over 3,000 bridges uh, in length of uh, 3,000 kilometers. So that's why we are uh, at least we call ourselves a national team for bridge construction. And uh, we believe we're also the company who has built the most bridges uh, worldwide. Um, so these are some ongoing projects that could be very interesting. You see uh, the cable state bridges and the suspension bridges, uh, both has the same, exactly the same span length, 1,092 meters, uh, designed to double deck. Uh, on the bottom, we have four railway line. They are all designed to high speed railway standard. On the top, that's four, uh, that's six or eight uh, of highways. So these are all world class bridges, um, very big span, uh, maybe the, 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 the biggest. And uh, speaking of Wuhan, right now we're also doing two bridges in Wuhan. Uh, please click, uh, Patrick. Next, uh, yes. So these two bridges are the bridges we're currently built in uh, Wuhan. 
uh, Qinshan Yangtze Bridge on the top, 932 meter main span. Uh, I will come back to this bridge uh, later. Uh, the bottom one, uh, Yangtze Yangtze River Bridge, with main span of 1,700 meters. Uh, this is supposed to be the second largest uh, worldwide. Uh, but this bridge has already opened to traffic uh, at the end of last year. So this bridge is not hit uh, by the uh, virus, uh, but all the three, the, the, the rest of the three ones, uh, they are. Uh, next, please. Uh, so when we come to the, uh, the pandemic, uh, for me, it all started from the Chinese Red Year Spring Festival. Uh, this year started very early, so on the 22nd of January, January we already st uh, stayed at home. Then uh, just one day later, uh, we heard that Wuhan city uh, is abruptly locked down. And then I got a message from Air France. Uh, they have canceled their flight flying from Wuhan to Paris on 28th of January, which I have booked for a PIAC kickoff meeting on that day. Then I started my two months uh, self-quarantine period. Uh, now, this is the end of January, so it's already uh, three and a half months ago. So if you ask my, my impression on this special period, first is this, this picture. I took uh, uh, of my Barkani, this is my Barkani. Uh, you know, in front of it, uh, there's a Wuhan Zoo, uh, so it used to be very crowded, but not so quiet. And uh, the second one, um, the broom can stand for itself. <laughs> so you all know that this happened on 11th of uh, February. Uh, this has amused my daughter uh, very much. And then what are the impression? I believe that's this uh, online shopping or online group shopping, because uh, this is more or less the only way uh, which we can get uh, the uh, daily necessities. Uh, and then for myself, I don't know, just maybe inspired by this movie, uh, I started to plant potato, maybe for just in case, I don't know. Uh, next, please. Patrick, please, next. Yeah, uh, for most of my colleagues, uh, they are working uh, after uh, the Chinese Spring uh, Festival, they have started to work uh, from home. And uh, uh, Annie is, my, is one of my colleagues. She has recorded uh, those period. Uh, you see, basically she was saying in early February, she has to arrange, she has to change her lifestyle. She has to divide the whole day into work, study and daily life activities. So so that she can use a, a, a good use a four day to make it a good circle. And uh, uh, if I can read, uh, partly read the second paragraph, today is the 17th day of shutdown of Wuhan city. We are warming and being warmed with each other, being together to go through the difficulties. And we truly believe no winter is insurmountable. So we can see that those are really special. Those were really special, uh, difficult time for us. And NBC is uh, one of the biggest uh, company, uh, infrastructure building company in Wuhan. We have also uh, uh, done a lot uh, in the early stages for the fighting. Uh, NBC, we have participated on this hospital, this is the San Hospital, and uh, the, uh, we have changed the uh, 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 Hanko compartment hospital to add more beds and also we are building three uh, more existing hospitals to change it to designated hospitals next please uh, also to uh, these hospitals will be for um, uh, patients with heavy symptoms and uh, many of my of my colleagues they also volunteered to uh, stand on the forefront of the uh, fight uh, line and uh, uh, for example, the next picture shows uh, uh, my colleague, Mr. Fu, uh, who has uh, participated on the building of uh, Leysen Sun Hospital. That's the next one, Patrick. And, and also, um, you know, the company has arranged uh, uh, donations uh, for uh, the battle. And uh, uh, what I want to say here, especially want to say here, uh, my colleagues, so uh, MBC colleagues, we have arranged uh, uh, about four and a half million uh, Chinese yuan uh, uh, to donate to the Red Cross uh, Hubei uh, 
society, I mean, to, in support of this uh, uh, battle. Uh, next, please, Patrick. I have added a lot of animation here. So maybe Patrick can follow my pace uh, to make it more quicker. Um, this again, my colleague, Mr. Wang, he has uh, uh, recorded, very closely monitored the official announced data, the confirmed cases. And we can see on the top one, the, the blue line represents the confirmed cases of the whole country. And the second orange one is uh, that of Hubei province. And then the gray one, the third one, uh, is uh, that of uh, Wuhan uh, city. So you can see Wuhan has the most uh, uh, confirmed cases for the whole country. So that's why we, uh, we were the center. And uh, uh, this figure is difficult to read, but one column is representing 10 days. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, seven columns. That's about uh, uh, two more months. And this red line is when we started our head office. So as you can see that uh, abruptly, uh, two months later, the curves becomes too flat. And then two more months, uh, we started, we already started our head office uh, uh, work. But uh, what measures we have taken uh, for uh, head office, Head, headquarter office reopening. So first of all, of course, uh, the uh, health screening. So all these tests we have to do, to, 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 to do. Everyone who come to work should uh, get this uh, health screening. And then we have to prepare uh, all, all these uh, um, anti-pandemic uh, uh, suppliers, uh, the safety equipments. And, and the next one is this uh, thorough disinfectioning works, uh, both indoor, outdoors. And then uh, this entrance control, um, next picture, the temperature, the identity. Uh, what I want to emphasize here is the, on the right side, this green code, what we call the Hubei Health Code. Uh, this is something that, this is a sort of a travel document, a travel certificate. Uh, you need to show this when you go to work. When you go back to your residential uh, building, uh, when you go to public uh, transportation or when you go shopping, whenever there's a mass gathering or, or whenever you leave your house, you need to show this. And you apply this from your smart mobile phone. So um, then this, uh, th then this is, uh, you know, my, my parents, they are in age of uh, 83, 83, 84 years old. Uh, we we were together during the uh, quarantine period. We were together. You know, we just uh, um, tried very hard to teach them how to use uh, their smart mobile phone. I mean, to apply for this uh, green code. Very interesting. Okay, next one, please. Uh, next picture. Uh, right. Um, you know, these are the measures that we have taken for our head headquarters offices. These are in the cities. But uh, when we talk about projects, bridge projects or tunnels, highways projects, uh, at uh, early stage of uh, work, uh, work resumption, uh, because you know different provinces, uh, you know they uh, the policies may be slightly different, so the traffic has not fully opened, and uh, uh, many prov provinces they require strict. Uh, travel document. So in this case, that it's difficult for the workers to travel from their hometown to the project site. That what we did is that we arrange special traffic for them. You know, this picture shows a bus. Uh, we, we, and, and we also arranged one airplane, I mean, to pick up these workers from their hometown uh, to, uh, to, to the project site. And uh, uh, social distance is utmost important. It's required everywhere. Uh, for example, in the lift. Uh, so uh, how many people are allowed to, to, to go into the lift and the canteen, uh, the meal will be separately, uh, separately served and the meeting room and also in office. You know, if office is not enough for the previous number of uh, uh, employees, then they have to come in turn. So that's why, uh, uh, or, or you know, someone uh, will still work from at home. That's why uh, a cer certain percentage of my colleague they are still working from uh, home uh, right now. Next, please. 
So that's for headquarters. But all those prevention measures are more or less the same for the projects. Uh, right now, in BC, we have 142 projects uh, worldwide. And uh, this picture shows uh, Qinshan Yangtze River Bridge, the one I showed on uh, my first slide, on the second slide, because this one is located in Wuhan city. So this one is the last one that work is resumed. And, uh, and this happened on the 8th of uh, April. Uh, speaking of, uh, if, if, if there's something special, yes, uh, because usually for, for project camp, uh, you, have, uh, you have a camp, so people, people are live there. So that's why then we have to uh, engage a very strict access control for, uh, you know, for, for, for this camp uh, uh, monitoring and also closely the monitoring of temperature of staffs during work. And 142 includes uh, our projects overseas. Uh, on the bottom side, uh, left side, you see this bridge. This is uh, the uh, uh, Padma uh, River Bridge, uh, a very big one under construction right now. The, the one single bridge, the contract value is 1.5 billion US dollar. So very big one. This is the dream bridge of Bangladesh people uh, across uh, the Ganges River. And, uh, um, you know, we have uh, over uh, approximately 6,000 locals and uh, 900 Chinese uh, are working in Bangladesh. Uh, we have another two projects all together, and that's the people we have in Bangladesh. Uh, we know that uh, the number is uh, is uh, start to increase in Bangladesh. So, you know, situation uh, with, with this overseas project will be a little bit complicated for us. On the, on the right side is uh, our two projects in Tanzania, one harbor and one bridge. Uh, in these countries, uh, you know, the, 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 they are in the different stages of the, uh, the, the data. And also the government policy, uh, the medical status uh, is all differ, so, so it's a uh, it's kind of difficult for us to um, on one side to keep in the project progress on the other side and to you know um, uh, to prevent and control the uh, virus. Um, so we are trying our best. We're doing our best to to uh, to to do this, and we're also helping the local people. Uh, for for example, in Malaysia. Uh, we have donated uh, about 50,000 masks and 2,000 protective suits together with other uh, agencies uh, to the local government. In Bangladesh, uh, we, we prepared 2,500 masks uh, to the Padma Bridge garrison. Uh, and this happened on a very early uh, stage because my presentation was prepared about uh, uh, one month ago, uh, no, about uh, three to four, three to four weeks ago, sorry. Um, and uh, just a couple of days ago, I understand, I know that uh, about half a million masks has been arranged to Padma Bridge uh, because the number is really uh, sorry. So we, we need to take special uh, care. Uh, next, please. Right, uh, so um, right now I'm working as a member for Task Force 3.1. Um, this is the uh, road infrastructure and transport uh, security. Our chairman is Mr. Savero uh, Palacetti. Uh, he and his team prepared a report uh, titled Security of Road Infrastructure in the year 2019. And in this report, uh, they have uh, uh, given general principles of a security-minded approach uh, for technical and operational recommendations to protect against a range of physical and cyber threat. And uh, uh, among threat, they have mentioned that pandemic is a threat. So maybe this is one of uh, the early reports from PIAC that pandemic is clearly mentioned. And uh, now we are working under his leadership. Uh, we have identified a cyber risk. Also, this is the very beginning. I've, I've seen their records, you know, for the meeting, kickoff meeting. And uh, I totally agree. Never before had this cyber security uh, be a, a so big problem. Uh, so on the one side, uh, I've mentioned that, you know, even my, my 
my parents in age of uh, 83, 84, they need to use this uh, smart mobile phone. And uh, uh, also currently most organizations, they will have a large number of people working uh, from home. So this uh, um, cyber security uh, together plus uh, the pandemic make things even more complicated. So we need to do uh, really do something uh, for this uh, safety. Next, please. And uh, I think that uh, that comes to the summary of my uh, report. Uh, it goes a little bit slow. Yes. Uh, so, uh, having said that the Wuhan, uh, the blockage uh, was started on 23rd of January, and then on 8th of April, uh, the outbound traffic uh, restriction uh, has been lifted uh, in Wuhan city. Uh, and then the catering industry, up to now 60% of restaurants has resumed uh, delivery services in Wuhan. So uh, people are still still not allowed to sit and eat. So this is just take away. And then for the manufacturing sectors, up to April 16, more than 98% of large industrial compra, uh, enterprises in Wuhan has resumed work and production. I believe this includes MBEC. But though work is resumed, uh, we realize that pandemic remains a big security risk at the moment. For us, uh, that's uh, my hand, to, uh, my hand, two hand, uh, two sides. Virus prevention, both are important. Remains an utmost important uh, task. And no one's safe until everyone's safe. We know this from WHO. Uh, you know, in China, domestic uh, cases has been under control, but we have uh, imported cases. And to speak of international cooperation, in our case, that's overseas project. This is related to many countries and eventually the whole world. So solidarity is the key to win. Uh, we have to work together to fight the pandemic. Next, please. Now we come to my last slide uh, of my presentation. I will take this chance, I would like to take this chance to uh, express my sincere thanks to the medical workers, volunteers, and our friends from around the world who helped Wuhan, especially in that difficult time. And this is a video. Uh, it's not long, uh, less than one minute. Uh, it's a song uh, from a Japanese uh, artist, uh, a singer, and uh, uh, it also gives some images of Wuhan city so, uh, and the uh, Yangtze River. Our company is very, very near to this river. Uh, Let's see if this works. Yeah, uh, just, just on the bottom, bottom left yeah. side. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Let's see if this works for everyone. That's the question. Ah, oh, okay. So you're right, maybe it doesn't work because, uh, because of the speed. Eh? Yeah, this is where Wuhan located. Uh, it's on the Yangtze River. So that's why we call it a river city. And uh, we have uh, uh, many medical workers coming from all over China, I mean, to help us. Um, you know, every day we watch television, we were really uh, deeply touched. Um, I think that's why uh, the donation, the, the amount that I mentioned from NBC staff, and we are also in Wuhan, so um, uh, they, they, they're really heroes. Our president is saying Wuhan is a hero city and they are heroes. I think, yeah, that's pretty much my presentation. And uh, uh, thank you very much. Please leave time for the, uh, for, for the other speakers. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Hongbing, for the presentation. Uh, so, dear panelists, everyone, if you have questions about roads, roads, road projects for Hongbing, uh, please don't hesitate uh, to ask questions about, uh, about this. Uh, our next presenter is Hector Hovare from Mexico. Uh, Hector, uh, well, thank you very much uh, for uh, making yourself available and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, Perfect. Does everyone hear me all right? Yes, very well. Thank you. 
Okay, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, Veronica, Saverio, and Philippe for the invitation and for making this happen. And well, um, the topic for the presentation I have is a, is a, a phrase or a slogan that I try to, to, to find or to come up with that represents uh, our situation, but not our situation as a, a as the whole world but uh, in the road industry and this is while everyone looks in roads are open for service i think it's a it's, it's a phrase that basically represents what we have to do because roads need to be open in order to allow people to to lock in um can we move forward please so this is me i'm from mexico i'm the ceo of uh, a infrastructure development company that uh, does uh infrastructure uh, construction, PPPs, and, and road operation. I'm a civil engineer, I'm a member of PRX Technical Committee 1.3, and a member of the Task Force of Infrastructure and Transport Security. And I'm former president of the Mexican Roadway Engineering Association, which is the National Committee for Mexico uh, in PIAC. So next one, please. Okay, this will be our key discussion points. Uh, it's the road operation during COVID-19 and how to conduct some of the road works something very important that is the impact on traffic revenues especially for ppps and uh, a brief thing regarding maintaining relationship with authorities and suppliers we have to take in it, we have to bear into consideration that this is a health crisis therefore people are first and people and by people i mean everyone people that are locked in people that cannot lock in and our people in this industry are also fundamental fundamental and have to be part uh, the main part of of, of this uh of, of they have to be the ones that we we need to take care of them first in order to keep on moving or to keep the the the, the business activity as patrick said at first this is regarding issue one and issue two which is ensuring employees health and safety and the one is maintaining activity and business continuity without the first one you can't have the second one so patrick can we move forward please so there's another phrase here that I would like to, to, to everyone to bear in mind, that is, we must keep the roads open for service. That's a must, but we have to take into account, obviously, the ones that actually do keep the roads open for service. So uh, we came with an ADC of road operation, and uh, in Mexico, things started to develop uh, mid march late march but we started doing things early march uh, first of all people over 65 and with certain diseases the ones that we all or certain conditions that one that the one that we already know were sent home and did, this doesn't mean they were laid off <clears throat> this just means that they were sent home with their with their wages intact and they are working whatever they can from home the second the second uh, activity is starts well, it begin, it, it, at the beginning and end of each shift, there's a temperature measurement for everyone. There are, it's a brief health status interview in which we, what we're trying to identify is if someone has any kind of symptoms related to the virus. We'll, later on, we will talk about what happens if they do have, or they, if they do present them. <clears throat> Then we make a slight review of uh, safety equipment. Everyone has gloves, masks, and face shields. And this is very important because they don't, they not, they, even though they, they are people in the offices that only interact with our people, the ones, uh, Patrick mentioned them, the ones that um, are in the tool boots, I mean, in the, in the, in the tall boots, those, those people have interaction with uh, with many others and we, we cannot control what happens outside of our uh, um, premises therefore we need to take care of everyone and most of the ppps in mexico are user payment so you have that interaction and even though there are tax for electronic toll in mexico roughly i would say half and half would could be a, a good estimation of what happens in our toll roads meaning that half of the people pay with the electronic toll and half of them pay with actual money so you do have this interaction even if it's very brief so um everyone as i say was uh, is wearing gloves masks and face shields and this is from early march still 
and there's a disinfection of personnel, everyone that comes in, there's a designated area for that that we will see later on as well. And also the disinfection of surfaces and objects to be used by operators. So these measures happen at the beginning and at the end of every shift. We need to bear into account that we have three shifts during the day. So there's a lot of people coming in and coming out. Also, we have a continuous vehicle rest area and office disinfection. The rest areas are also very important due to the fact that this is where, where people from the outside come and go. And this is where we can have any control regarding them. But what we can do is do something for the, for the facilities. So this is a, a continuous effort of disinfection. Also, as I was saying, there are specific areas for that. There's constant communication and training regarding disinfection and good habits. <laughs> At the beginning of the crisis, we, we, we noticed, and I think the whole world noticed, that uh, the first issue for um, preventing was a normal sanitation or good habits um, thing. Basically, as everyone has said, washing their hands and do not touch your face and wash your hands, hands constantly. This is a normal health, health habit, and, and we try to enforce it, enforce it with many others as well. And that constant communication is with ads or posters around the facilities, and we, we've been having constant training with groups of no more than eight people or 10 people at most, and in open spaces or big spaces for that. Because we need to reassure that people bear this in mind, even if it's not by conviction, by a mandatory thing because it's sad to say but here in the country a lot of people really or don't think this is a big issue or this is happening or this can happen to them so as i was saying if it's not something that you believe in well at least it's mandatory <clears throat> and they have to be clear of that <laughs> and then the proper distancing how did we manage to do the proper distancing well regarding the operation of the road what we did is distribute the, the, the uh, everyone in the sense that some people can work for home so those were sent home and that allow us to have more space in order to redistribute people to avoid a uh, congregation or to achieve proper distancing can we go to the next one patrick please so in here we will see some photos of how people are um, prepared or doing their normal operations in, in the top line, we can see the, the toll boots and, and toll collectors with their gloves, their face masks, and their face shields. Um, this is a continuous effort. They also have gel in their, in their boots in order to, to, well, to keep this sanitation possible. And in the, lower, in the lower line, we can see as well people. The first one is a, a guy at the toll booth. The second one is a sanitation effort in the, in the bathrooms of the rest areas, then comes someone inside the offices. And the last one is not a roll call, but when people come in starting their shifts, this is how they line themselves out. The next one, please. Then again, this is a sanitation procedure as well as the temperature call. And in the top two, I mean, in the, in the top line, the, the, the center and the, and the far right uh, images, just depict the area of sanitation. In this area of sanitation, there's a mat with chlorine in order to soak your, your boots or your, or your shoes on them, on it. So we can stop the transmission over there as well. And there's a, a small table with a gel and, and, and supplies that you might need, whether there are gloves or a face mask. Everyone already has their, their face shields. And um, well, if they need to change them, it's, it's just as simple as, as, as asking for a new one. The next one, please, Patrick. So this is as well a imagery of uh, sanitation of the vehicles, of the tools, of the rest areas, of the boots, and some of the cartels or ads that I was talking about regarding communication. The next one, please. So what happens if someone shows any symptoms? Well, there's a, there is an immediate isolation. Then is the COVID-19 testing, the traceability assessment. The isolation for those in the tra traceability assessment, there comes a disinfection of areas and further testing depending on the results. 
the results here in Mexico, depending on the area of the country, takes um, it takes like from three to six days. So even though that might seem a lot, um, it's better to be on the safe side than anything else. So that's that's what happens when someone shows any symptoms. Um, COVID-19 testing is being done by public and private hospitals as well as laboratories. What we do is normally we send our people or we take our people to a, a, a private laboratory. Every every office has a, a cooperation agreement with those uh, laboratories. So that can uh, expedite things, expedite things, sorry. So that's what we have, that's what happens whenever anyone has symptoms. If they are positive for COVID-19, what we do is isolate them and uh, just help with the logistics any way we can regarding food or medical treatment, anything. So far, fortunately, we haven't got any positive uh, testings for people in operation. So, so far, so good. But nevertheless, we know things might happen or will happen. So we're ready for it. Uh, the next one, Patrick, please. So um, we do have road, I mean, we do have roadworks. And how are we handling that? First of all, being in the open field reduces risk of, of contagion due to social distancing. Uh, we also reduced uh, the number of people in each crew. And um, the same measures as we saw with operation, we see them here in, in the maintenance, which is uh, the, the temperature measurement, the interview, the safety equipment, the, and the constant disinfection, as well as the constant communication and train, training. So pretty much is the same. Although in here, we believe that the risk is reduced being in an open field first with less people and without interaction to external people. The next one, please. The next one will only show some, some images of, uh, of this uh, activities, but in the open field or regarding maintenance. As you can see is face shields again, the, the masks, the temperature, uh, communication, so would we try and we, we can get a glimpse of this here, but uh, there is the, the crews are reduced to the, to the minimum necessary, which also can actually you say that makes us more efficient. And yes, yeah. well, however, some of these uh, works have been reduced only to the necessary ones. The next one, Patrick, please. So the next topic is uh, the impact of traffic revenues. And even though we must keep the roads open for service, this is a huge thing and a risky, a risky issue for PPPs. Uh, at least at the time being, or uh, uh, as for today, and I will I will go into into that for the, uh, further. So, what we have experienced basically is since the first week of March, a decrease of forty percent in revenues. So that means roughly a 40, 45 percent of a decrease in traffic. So, however, banks have been open regarding minor restructures or postponements. And the, the, the good thing here is, at least for in our projects, we have a debt service that covers six months of interest and capital. So we're, we're ready not for this kind of uh, issue, but for issues in which we experience decrease in revenues. So by that measure, we're kind of uh, on the safe side now. Um, However, it's important to take into account, uh, I'm not minimizing the crisis, but PPP projects are long-term projects. And these might be a decrease in maybe six, eight or 12 months. So in the life of the whole project, this might not be as bad as it seems. However, we need to take into account that commitments are, are already established in the, in, in the whole time frame of the project. But, at least for us having this debt service fund for each of the projects is uh it, it's working well it we haven't used them although we have this decrease in, in, in revenues that we're still in time with everything um and the next one please patrick so maintaining relationships with authorities and with suppliers this might come as a paradox but i i strongly believe we need to stay closer than than before and by this i don't mean physically but in constant communication, 
in a broader communication and a more straightforward one in the sense that we need to be talking and we need to be um, showing what we or showing and telling what uh, our situation is at the time being how we're managing it how how can both parties of all or all the stakeholders involved can do something to help the others and um, because what has happened to one will happen to other ones and vice versa so can, we can learn some of, of the other experiences um therefore i would strongly suggest this stay closer than before um that's uh that's all i have for today i think yes yes thank you patrick and thanks everyone for your um attention have a great day uh, thank you hector thank you so much it was really spot on it's very interesting to have uh, such uh, hands-on uh, uh direct information about how uh, uh uh, real life operators uh, have to manage uh, their projects and their infrastructure uh, in uh, such a situation. Thank you very much. I invite everyone to direct their questions to Hector and to Hong Bing, of course, uh, using the chat uh, channel for that. And I also invite everyone who has uh, not yet uh, uh, described their name uh, properly to either to do it in Zoom or to send me a message or Valentina a message so that we can name you properly. I see someone called iPad, for example, and someone called Galaxy Samsung, which is not very uh, descriptive, I suppose. Thank you very much. Our next uh, presenter is uh, from Malaysia. Uh, Dennis, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Patrick. Welcome ladies, welcome ladies and gentlemen. Good evening from Malaysia. Next. Next. I'm Dennis Ganendra. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Mink Consult. I was the Secretary General for nine years of RAAA and currently I'm a council member. Next. Today I'll be telling you about the Malaysian experience and I'll be covering these areas, the impacts of COVID-19 in Malaysia and the region, Malaysia's response to COVID-19, the impact on construction, the impact on road transport, the impact on other forms of transport, and some suggestions for the way forward in the short term and long term. As you can see, I'm covering quite a large area. My slides are quite detailed. There's a lot of information, which I think will be very useful for you. Uh, for the purposes of this presentation, I'm going to do a very quick overview of my slides. If you have any questions, you can ask me the Q&A. And if you still have further questions, feel free to email me. So firstly, impacts of COVID in Malaysia and the region. Next. On the right-hand side is a table of the deaths and cases uh, in various countries. Malaysia is at the bottom there. So you can see we've had about 6,600 cases and about 100 deaths. So in terms of poor population, that's 206 cases per million population and about three deaths per million population. So we're about 100 times better than the worst affected countries. If you look at the table on the left-hand side, this looks at Malaysia vis-a-vis -vis the other countries in Southeast Asia. And what you can see is that our situation is replicated in other countries in Southeast Asia, except for Indonesia and Philippines. Next. However, the impact in terms of economic impact on Malaysia has been severe. We're looking at at least a 2% drop in GDP, most probably more, uh, about 2.5, uh, 4 billion losses per day of the shutdown, and about 1 million people will lose their job uh, as a result of this. So the economic impact has been tremendous and will be tremendous. Next. In Malaysia, we don't even have to just deal with COVID. We have other impacts we have to deal with. Uh, we had a change in government in March, which was very, very unexpected. And this government now has to stand up to a no confidence vote in the next couple of weeks. We've also had crushing oil prices, which is a key element of our economy to deal with. So as well as dealing with COVID, we've had to deal with other crises. Next. 
Next. There have been some positive impacts of COVID. Actually, quite a few. Oh, go, go back one. Go back one, Patrick. Uh, there have been some positive impacts of COVID. And in terms of the impact on the environment, it's been very positive. 50% uh, reduction in waste thrown into the river in the Stangon Maritime Project, 43% reduction in waste thrown into the Klang River, air quality improved by 14%, river quality improved by 28%. Next. So how did Malaysia respond to COVID-19? So what we have here is a timeline of key events starting from 25th of January, the first case of COVID in Malaysia uh, until present day. What's in red is the key points in this story, uh, which is uh, in the 16th of March, the implementation of the control orders. And what you can see is every two weeks after that, approximately, we've had a different phase of the control order, essentially lifting it up until in the 4th of May, we have from a control order to a conditional control order where uh, essentially all businesses were open, uh, but social distancing rules must apply. Next. Uh, and so this goes into a little bit more detail of it. Phase one of the MCO was very, very severe. Phase two, equally severe. With phase three, we opened up certain parts of the economy. And with phase four, uh, uh, further parts of the economy open, and now in the current phase, what we call the conditional movement control order, uh, very much uh, most sectors of the economy are open now, but with uh, social distancing rules. Next. What we have here is a plot of the infection rate, the bar chart, versus the recovery rate, which is the line, and it shows you the different phases of the um, uh, MCO that we applied. So you can see in the phase one and phase two of the MCO, the infection rate was very high, but you can see by the time we get to phase three and now phase four of the MCO, the infection rate has dropped significantly and also the recovery rate is higher than the infection rate. Next. So what has been the impact of COVID on construction? Next. Firstly, you've got to appreciate the uh, go back one. You've got to appreciate the importance of the construction industry in Malaysia. It's a US $30 billion industry representing 4.5% of the economy. We've got 95,000 contractors in the country and um, a workforce of about 850,000 people uh, registered and a few hundred thousand unregistered people. It, construction is a key driver of the economy with very fast impacts upwards and downwards. Next. So in terms of the key day impacts on the construction industry, on the 19th of March, we were asked to shut down completely. Uh, go back one, Patrick. Uh, back, back. Uh, on the 19th of March, uh, down one. Perfect. That one. Okay, on the 19th of March, uh, the next day, we were told that sites could operate just to safeguard the sites and also to make sure there's no hazard to the public. On the 23rd of March, some sites were open. On the 10th of April, engineering professional services were allowed to operate. 16th of April, other sites were allowed to open. But it's really on the 4th of May when all sectors were open that construction could really start. So what happens is even though sites have got permission to operate because the total supply chain was not there, they couldn't really do much work. Uh, this is in particular concrete suppliers. Next. Uh, when we are allowed to start work, there's a lot of rules and regulations and guidelines given to us by our government, uh, which is all listed there. And some of the requirements are that all sites must have body temperature scanning both in and out daily. Uh, site employees to provide health declaration and go for COVID screening, social distancing within the site, three hourly disinfecting of key areas. Uh, initially, we had restricted hours, but that's been re re uh, lifted recently. And all these uh, rules also apply to the centralized labor quarters, not just the sites. Next. We have some 
excellent, excellent examples of contractors who risen to the challenge and really adopted these very, very well. Next. But we also have some major challenges to the sector. Some contractors already in financial distress will be pushed over the edge and many bankruptcies are anticipated. A lot of workers have gone unpaid this last month. We have a government salary subsidy scheme, but it's only for nationals. So a lot of our uh, foreign workers, uh, registered and unregistered, have got unpaid, uh, homeless and hungry. COVID screening is a so important element. It's, it's expensive. It's 100 US dollars per test per person. There is a government paid testing scheme, but it's only for national and it takes time. And what we found is that government rules were applied to different degrees by different contractors. And sadly, we found that COVID clusters now have occurred at some construction sites. Next. So what has been the impact on road transport? So we explain a bit more detail of the control order in terms of road transport. So in the first phase, uh, really there was no cars allowed on the road except for essential services and buying amenities and you couldn't go beyond 10 kilometers from your house uh, and it was restricted to one person per car. Uh, in phase two, very much the same thing. In phase three, um, uh, now we're allowing some travel uh, within the district and interstate, but with approval from the National Security Council. Next, still one car per person. Next. Uh, and then in stage, oops, go back one. Uh, in stage four, more countries were allowed to, uh, sorry, more companies were allowed uh, to travel during this period, and you went from one person to two persons per car ruling. And now in the CMCO, uh, you can freely travel either for business or for personal reasons within the district. To go interstate, you need to get approval, and it's four cars, uh, per, four persons per car ruling. Okay. Uh, of course, during this period, uh, essential goods were able to travel. Next. So what has been the impact on the roads? Traffic demand has dropped dramatically. Uh, there has been a shift from public transport to private cars, but this is in no way offset the overall drop in traffic figures. So in terms of congestion in Malaysia, it ranges between 60 to 90% in KL. This has dropped down to about 10% congestion in KL during the uh, movement control order. And that congestion is really associated with police roadblocks. What we have here is the congestion levels in the last seven days uh, in 2020 and the last seven days uh, last year. And you can see the congestion levels were much higher last year than it is now. Next. Uh, in terms of uh, nitrogen dioxide concentration, it's re reduced by 60%. Uh, there's been a twofold increase in good air quality. This is important. Traffic accidents has dropped significantly during the NCO. So pre-NCO, we looked at about 1,500 accidents per day and between 14 to 17 deaths a day. So during NCO, that rate has dropped to 371 cases or five deaths a day. So in terms of road deaths, over this period, they've saved about 500 road deaths as opposed to the 100 deaths from COVID. So you could arguably say that COVID has saved lives in Malaysia. Next. Impact on toll roads has been very, very dramatic. Uh, some concessionaires already in financial distress will be pushed to default. Some concessionaires with health cash flows will be able to weather this form. Um, some research indicated the revenues will decrease by about 15% this year, assuming a 90% shortfall initially, uh, increasing to um, 50% in the next month, and 30% in the next month, and then 10% in the following month. Uh, there's also impact on toll roads under construction. It's unlikely that they can meet their completion dates. And again, there will be pressure on those concessionaires. Next. That's traffic before MCO. Next. 
Uh, that's traffic during MCO. Yeah. Next. There's also been a severe impact on other forms of transport. Next. Uh, for public transport, we have road-based public transport. Next. Rail-based. Rail-based public transport. Next. Uh, we spent a lot of money on LRT and MRT systems. These are heavily used in the Klang Valley. Next. So what we found is that a result of COVID-19, less people needing to commute, people concerned about their risk of infection in public spaces. There's been a 65% drop in ridership, even now when the CMCO has been announced. Um, the traffic operators are enforcing social distancing, they're disinfecting vehicles and stations, they carry out commuter temperature screening, and what they've done is to spread out the peak period so that the crowd can spread out. Next. And here we're giving you more details. So before MCO, it's a million plus uh, ridership per day on our public transport system in the Klang Valley. Uh, during MCO, you can see it varies between a 65 to 80% drop in ridership, even now after things have opened up. Um, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the peak hours has increased by, by one hour. Rail services, the, the trains have to operate at no more than 50% of full commuter capacity, and the bus services have to operate no more than 30% of capacity to ensure social distancing during this period. Next. Uh, there's also been an impact on the port sector. Uh, initially, uh, essential goods were pushed up, but not essential goods were held up at the ports. Within just a matter of days, the port capacity was totally filled up, and the ministry then had to push freight forwarders and haulage companies to clear the ports as quickly as possible. Next. Uh, now, uh, our port has signed up with 20 other ports in the world to keep seaborne trade open throughout this pandemic. Next. So in terms of the way forward, we have some short-term measures and some long-term measures. So in the short-term measures, the demand for public transport will increase. And as you go back to near normal travel demand patterns, it will be difficult to maintain social distancing. There's a new phenomenon now of queuing for trains queuing for platforms, queuing to get in to the stations. So I think now improve uh, travel information, telling people how long the queue times are at each station is very important so that people can plan for their transport uh, uh, better. There is a lot of contractual implications uh, because of COVID-19, not just in transport sector, but in all sectors. And we are looking at potentially a COVID-19 act. COVID-19 has given us maybe a once in a lifetime chance to really map out environmental damage. Now our rivers are clean, our airs are clean. So what we're pushing for is increased monitoring and increased frequency of monitoring uh, to see where the environmental loading is coming on, at what locations, at what time, and try to map it with the opening of a sector so we can really determine what are the causes of environmental damage to our air and the rivers. In terms of long-term measures, we think that COVID-19 will have long-term impacts on travel demand, and we need to do a study to see the impact on each mode of transport. Uh, for construction, we have to reinforce less labor and tough incentive construction methods like IBS and MBS. And it's important now that we promote the e-economy, including the mandatory use of multi-lane free flow at our toll stations, uh, all government and authority submissions to be now electronic going forward. And really in all contracts uh, and ways of doing business, we need to formalize our digital interfaces. So video conferencing tools and what we're using now, electronic submissions, uh, will form part of the uh, contracts going forward. Next. And the future of mobility, the work from home culture will grow, people 
will keep away from crowds and public spaces. We might see new innovative forms of uh, public commuting. Bicycles might become more popular. Uh, people might use cars more and shy away from public transport, and people may use motorbikes more. Um, there will be change. Let us embrace the change. Lastly, thank you very one. Thank you very much, everyone. Be healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much, Denis, for this uh, very comprehensive uh, presentation. And for those of us in the audience who have not had the time to read uh, in detail every slide, uh, please uh, refer to uh, the recording that will be online uh, probably uh, tomorrow. Uh, uh, next and last panelist uh, is Roberto Aguerebelli uh, from Mexico. Roberto, the floor is yours. And you need to uh, unmute your microphone. Good morning. Perfect. Good night or good uh, afternoon to everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, sharing these experiences. I will try to, uh, well, I will focus my presentation on uh, the actions uh, taken, uh, but uh, are, are about to be taken as a resilience, with a resilience per perspective to, to restore and to restart gradually full activities and what are some of the challenges that we are facing in Mexico. So I hope this can be of some use for other, other uh, countries. Uh, first, well, to present myself, uh, to introduce myself, I'm the general director of the Mexican Institute of Transport. I've been working there for the last 30 years. I'm a civil engineer, and uh, Juan Fernando Mendoza is a, a senior researcher at the Institute and helped me put together this presentation. And I uh, was a coordinator for uh, climate change adaptation, disasters management, and environment of the last cycle called PIARC, with three technical committees at the time. Well, next, please. <clears throat> well, this is more or less the timeline of uh, the measures taken in Mexico, as you will uh, recognize uh, or identify the very similar to other countries, except for the dates and maybe the time in between uh, in each of the phases as they have been declared for taking the preventive and the sanitary uh, measures. Now we are as more or less as shown in the graph on the right side. As you see, we hope to be at the top of the curve and bending it for the next, in the next weeks. Next, please. So I, I want to, in, in a country like ours, which is big as, not as big as China <laughs> and others, but big enough and complicated enough, uh, we, we have this kind of picture of the cases, of the confirmed cases. Uh, throughout the territory. So you see in the scale on the left side, what is the number of confirmed cases in each state uh, and uh, also, well, in each uh, municipality, sorry. So this is the, the smallest uh, territorial political administrative uh, uh, extension or unit in, in, in the country. So as you see, you may see uh, two things in this graph, in this map. On the left upper side, you can uh, see a Baja California state and well, and municipality, which is very, which are very, very big, very uh, uh, extended because of 
the, the low population density there. But uh, what is important is the proximity to the border in San Diego, California, uh, which has uh, also maybe had an impact on how the uh, virus has uh, developed in the in the area. You can see other um, uh, counties or municipalities uh, closer to the northern border, which have, uh, as you see here, stronger color, so you have bigger, uh, uh, more numerous cases. On the other side, you can see uh, uh, in the middle of the country, the, the municipalities are much smaller because the population density is much bigger. And there you see also a, a, a stronger color uh, sh showing, but not at this scale maybe. And then on the right side, you see the Yucatan Peninsula with also a, a, the, some municipalities like a, the small island you see on the right side, which is Cozumel, which is a, a, it's a destination for a, a very high a number of, of cruises. And that was one of the first cases also we had in Mexico, how to deal with cruises. Uh, and then uh, you have the municipality that comprises uh, Tulum, uh, Cancun, of course, and Playa del Carmen, which are also important destinations. Next, please. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> in um, looking at the whole picture of the process, well, we have also had our prevention measures on the right side, I would not go through them, then uh, some additional pre-partners, then uh, the immediate response, as you have heard already <clears throat> uh, uh, from different countries, and then uh, the phase where we, many of our countries are, are uh, experiencing now, which is uh, how to recover to a normal or even resilient status that would mean a better way to operate our road transport network and our road infrastructure. So uh, some of the actions that have been taken during the teleworking or homeworking now in Mexico is to prepare bids to recover construction works as up, even though it has been declared as essential economic activity, the maintenance of roads and some emergency works when some structure or important uh, component of, the, of a road might be in, in danger of, of interrupting traffic. Uh, the rest, rehabilitation, major maintenance works and others and new construction or modernization hasn't been uh, ongoing. So we have to prepare <clears throat> the bits to recover this, and this has been uh, the case in Mexico. Also, uh, some reaccommodations of national budget uh, originally destined for uh, road works also have been uh, revised. So uh, there have been uh, talks on, uh, ongoing between the Ministry of uh, communications and transport and the Ministry of the Treasury or Finance Ministry in Mexico to ensure the budget for uh, the continuing uh, work as planned and with the adjustment that it should take in if part of the money uh, had to be destined to other priorities to face the pandemic. Uh, also, <clears throat> There has to be an insurance of the operation of transport corridors because uh, due to the uh, uh, early response and, and after you see, uh, as you see in the map, there are different uh, experiences and different consideration at the local government on how to deal with the, with the back to normal. So there are uh, some municipalities that say that uh, well, we, we have very low charges of of disease, which would like maybe to prevent them to 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 be uh, 
uh, in another position and some others uh, which uh, uh, might be willing to uh, restart as soon as possible with the usual activities. So there are different kinds of restrictions throughout the territory for, for, for transportation. Uh, of course, essential activities have been allowed, but sometimes things are not well, very well interpreted uh, uh, or well mandated at the local level. So we might have some, we have had some problems to, uh, for some services, uh, interurban uh, services to go on. Of course, the areas to reactivate construction uh, will have to uh, be uh, taken care of with all the sanitary precautions. And also, we, then we have to learn about this for future events and integrate the lesson learned for every, every uh, uh, part of the, of the process should be uh, implemented uh, and as a, as a way to improve future events uh, response. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, now here you see uh, the main corridors in Mexico and, and uh, uh, also uh, the, the intensity of the, of, of the disease in different parts. And you might uh, see this correspondence uh, between the main corridors and, how, and where are the, the, the territories where the uh, disease has uh, uh, impact most. So you see really more or less clear uh, that there is this uh, high, very high correlation between mobility and and the intensity of the impact of the of the <clears throat> epidemia in in the territory so uh, uh, as you see uh, well this uh, along the the main corridors you might see different well different densities so different experiences at the local level and different uh, uh, positions of the public and of the local authorities. So for the continuity of operations throughout the territory, it's not a straightforward task of just mandating it at the federal national level. So you have to deal with, with some uh, problems uh, to, uh, to work on with local authorities and different uh, uh, actors in the social level. Next, please. <clears throat> so here you see, for instance, an example of the border. As I mentioned, to Ciudad Juarez, one of the most important uh, cross borderings to the United States, uh, uh, and and the connection with the municipality where it uh, is, it uh, state capital. So these are the two areas with most uh, population and most uh, very uh, closely related economically. So the traveling between two have, has usually is very intensive. So this is how it can be explained also this, uh, uh, this uh, correlation uh, between its location and the, and the corridor and the main, main roads on main transport corridors. Next, please. This is a view of, of central Mexico. As I mentioned, the density of population is much higher. So the, the, the territories of the uh, uh, municipalities are much uh, uh, smaller. And you, of course, there you have a, a denser uh, uh, um, road network, and also you have most of the uh, traveling and of the of the uh, um, traveling um, uh, volumes of 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 cars in roads and in public trans interurban transportation in Mexico, and then you see to the south how this is a main road to Acapulco which is the, the most important destination of people living in the, in the 
metropolitan area of Mexico City. And you see, can also see why uh, Acapulco has a, also a, a, a stronger color because of the, of the expansion of the disease. And then to the north, we have also in the main central Mexico, a very high densest populated area where our institute lies in, in Querétaro. And also you have uh, these, these things, how, how the connecting corridors uh, have played a role in how the disease has spread it along the, uh, the uh, along them. Next, please. Okay. <clears throat> So um, now we might have uh, some opportunities to to uh, to rely on these images and of the geographical analysis we can do with with this data to see how we can restore uh, how can we start the uh, the public works. Uh, that are needed and as well as other supply chain activities for essential activities and how they are interconnected uh, and uh, how to deal with these uh, local uh, policies that uh, are eager also to restart activities to avoid unemployment or a company's uh, bankruptcies. Next, please. Okay, um, in this in this map, you you will you can see uh, some of the reactions I was telling you about. This is a a tool that the institute has put on, and we will start to to uh, to make it available to to the authorities and to other economic agents. Uh, this is where uh, some uh, local authorities have uh, declared or mandated restrictions. Uh, for uh, foreign uh, vehicles, uh, uh, mainly passenger uh, public tra uh, public uh, transport, uh, interurban public transport, from from other from other contiguous municipalities. So, as you see, uh, we have spread it some of these red restricted areas, many of them in Yucatan Peninsula, but also. Uh, other places along the south coast of Mexico, the west coast, some others along the bo north border. Uh, so the, the, this this issue has been have to deal with uh, with the local authorities and uh, between them and the uh, bus companies, for instance, and other uh, different services as personal transportation, things like that. Next, please. <clears throat> you will see closer that with an example, for instance, in the central part of Mexico, near to Querétaro, in the corridor to the north border, as see shown on the left side. So if this municipality closed the transit to interurban or long range transportation, so we will be affected many other localities and many other services and uh, will be disrupted. So uh, this is one of the challenges. Uh, next, please. Um, this is a, a view, a closer view to the to one uh, maritime port, which is also very important with the, com with the trade with Europe. Uh, Tuxpan port has been for very long the Principal Volkswagen Group export uh, port to to uh, to Europe of certain uh, models of the of that brand, and as you see, if they uh, start to uh, uh, restrict the circulation of workers, many activities will be affected uh, related to those supply chains. Uh, in, I have to say that in Mexico, precisely 
in these days, yesterday, today, uh, has been mandated that uh, one of the industries considered not essential originally that will start its operations very soon with all the due care are those industries related with the car assembly supply chain because the United States is about to restart and many of the suppliers are located in Mexico. Next, please. So this is also a zoom view of the Yucatan Peninsula. And you can see here bigger municipalities. But these are some of them who have restricted uh, uh, transit and, and how this would affect uh, the access accessibility of the whole peninsula is, is a, a problem that has a, a motivated us to, to start to analyze the network from different point of views and where is the redundancy and how can we deal with this. Next, please. So this is the, the particular uh, towns where they have uh, put uh, posts to restrict circulation, to restrict uh, transit. Next, please. <clears throat> and then you can see a different uh, road classification. So on the red side, this is the classification that uh, has to do with, with the, with the with the geomet geometry of the road and and what the kind of vehicles you are allowed to 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 circulate on the, on it on the left side, as you see, uh, it's not quite continuous, neither redundant, uh, the same color that would mean the same classification to allow the same kind of vehicle to circulate in normal situation. Just imagine with restrictions. What are the logistic problems that would uh, 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 this uh, these towns face uh, in in the area? On the red, on the right side, you have the uh, uh, measure of the redundancy. You see uh, smaller segments of roads, which of course have no redundancy because they are just the way to access to particular towns in the peninsula. But then you have the other uh, stretches of road, uh, uh, longer roads, which might have some redundancy. This is not the case uh, uh, <clears throat> in, in, in the whole country. Uh, the, the, this uh, Yucatan Peninsula has a, a, becomes a lower density of road network than other areas, so it faces bigger uh, uh, challenges from this point of view. Next, please. <laughs> Next. Thank you. Uh, now you see uh, another way of looking at it uh, with uh, road connectivity. And there you see which are the roads that are uh, most important because they are connected to other uh, trunk roads in the, in the area. And then uh, what would happen if you affect the, the circulation of the transit on, on one of these uh, roads, how it would affect the rest of the accessibility in the, in the area. And then <clears throat> you can see on the right side, uh, well, what happens uh, since these local authorities have put these kind of measures, uh, you see in the white color the roads that wouldn't allow uh, everyone to circulate, and in, in the red, those who might be useful to continue uh, uh, working and allow the, uh, the, the activities, uh, every activity to go on. So problem is, thing is, is, isn't easy at all. 
that we are trying to work on how to analyze and how to help giving uh, directives that would harm the less and that would uh, uh, allow at the same time to uh, <clears throat> important activities to continue. Next, please. Okay, so I will leave here, I will end here. I will leave these uh, other present, other actions that have been taken uh, in the previous phases of the response and during the preparedness and during the response. Uh, so um, <clears throat> please feel free to go through them after uh, the presentation. If you have any questions, I will be happy to 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 respond it. Please, the next, I will just go quick through them. The public transportation actions, very similar as you have heard from other countries. Um, <clears throat> next, please. <clears throat> uh, you have heard from Hector some of the uh, response actions that have been taken in toll highways. Next, please. <clears throat> at the free roads uh, level also. Next, please. This is what rules now. This is uh, some recommendations that the public uh, transport uh, authorities have given for intercity operators. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, this is, uh, well, just a, to show that intercity passenger transport has been decreased, of course, because of of the of the um, of the sanitary measures, and uh, and well, in different in different cities of the country, you can see that uh, down to, in some cases, almost shut down completely, but uh, uh, well, the mean approximate has been, I think, around 60% decrease. Next, please. <clears throat> uh, also, in particular, uh, in Mexico, there have been special directives also as essential activities for all the workers in telecommunications industry and broadcasting, uh, which is, uh, for our sake, uh, in the same ministry, in the case of Mexico, the communications uh, branch is part of the of the same ministry as roads and all transport uh, activities. Next, please. <clears throat> okay, because that's it. And I've seen uh, some comments, and I will be willing to respond them. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto, and thank you, Fernando, uh, as well. Thank you for this uh, very interesting, uh, comprehensive uh, presentation covering the whole uh, country of uh, Mexico. Uh, for everyone, please, if you have questions, uh, you still have time to ask them in the chat. But now it's also when we move on to the questions and answers uh, session. It's going to be moderated by Christos Xenofontos uh, from the USA, who is the chair of our committee on performance of transport administrations. I also uh, would like to ask all our panelists, since we are behind schedule, uh, uh, that uh, ask them whether they can stay a little bit longer. We will probably, we will aim at ending maybe 20 minutes from now, uh, if that's okay with you. Thank you very much, Christos. The floor is yours. <coughs> Can you hear me? Yes, very well, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so thank you everyone. Thank you for everyone who is present here and to our panelists for the excellent material that they have shared with us today. And um, you know, that it's sparing a really good discussion over here. So I will start with um, Hong Bing. And uh, the first question to you please is, how are the work uh, and projects um, overseas affected and do the recipient countries consider this pandemic as force majeure and how do the contractors and clients settle this problem of delays, cost overrun, etc.? 
Yeah, thank you for the question. Uh, first of all, we have to follow, for the overseas project, we have to follow the country's rule, the country's policy. Um, in Malaysia, uh, we are right now doing a project. Uh, it is, uh, um, but it is called the upgrading and reconstruction project of uh, Bayanil Highway. So this is in Sarawak, Malaysia. Uh, Malaysia has a very clear policy that uh, all construction sites should be stopped. So we stopped for that project. But that project will already complete 90%. So uh, there's no big uh, impact on the project in Malaysia. But in Bangladesh, for example, in uh, Tanzania, uh, there's no clear uh, policy from country from the uh, country that project should be stopped. So in that that means that we have to continue with the project. But then some simultaneously to uh, prevent and control the virus. So that uh, rep represents the challenges for for us. Regarding the uh, how the, the the impact, you know, uh, this overseas projects many things come from China. Uh, or also we have materials uh, that we will purchase internationally. So this uh, custom clearance, uh, even though they have not said the project should be closed, but then they have proximated uh, public traffic. So all public traffic, custom clearances all present some difficulties. Then uh, if this is uh, related to key materials or key projects, then this will definitely uh, influence the progress. Um, so these are the difficulties we are facing. But whether we can treat it as a force majeure, uh, we don't know yet. Uh, so uh, right now, because we are still ongoing, uh, the things are still ongoing. We have informed uh, the client, and they all appreciate the things. Uh, so everything is under uh, recorded. And I think uh, this is the same for most most contract because I had been ten years since. Uh, I've been client for 10 years. What I would like to see is the contractor will do their best, I mean, to catch up the progress if everything uh, goes to smooth, uh, if the situation is under control related to uh, virus. So then uh, we will talk about uh, uh, this con contractual matters. Uh, thank you. I think this is my, my, my reply. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Bing. This is great. And uh, thank you for uh, being here. Um, our next question. Uh, Christos, be... Christos, could I uh, add a little bit to that uh, of course. Uh, question as well? Okay. Um, so we've looked into this, and really the admissibility of COVID 19 as a force majeure event hasn't been argued in open court. Uh, I think you need to look at it for contract by contract. A uh, key thing to look at is whether there is a pandemic or a, a disease clause in your force majeure definition. Um, we have had some, in my mind, uh, slightly perverse interpretations of the law, where most con uh, contractors uh, will have to abide by the laws of the country. And a lot of, let's say, the movement control order was an, uh, uh, an act of a lawful act by the by the country. So what they're saying is, well, you have to abide by the laws of the country, and that's a lawful act. So it's not a force measure. So there is this incredible variance of interpretation of this issue, and that's why the talk about a, uh, uh, a COVID nineteen act coming into place to kind of harmonise the interpretation of this is something that's widely debated and being considered. Uh, in the meantime, in Malaysia, prior to that coming on board, we have some other measures in place. So what we've done is to increase the uh, bankruptcy threshold and protection. So it was one month before you can take action. Now we've increased it to six months before you can take bankruptcy actions. Uh, the threshold minimum amount was also uh, 10,000 ringgit. It's been increased to 50,000 ringgit. Uh, and also we've had some concessions in terms of when filings can be done. So prior to the act being in place, whether it will come or not, there's also actions that, that can be done. Thank you. Dennis, thank you very much. That was really excellent information. And uh, given that this is a subject of interest, I will also um, ask uh, you know, uh, Hector and Roberto if they would like to add something on this particular one. Hector? Yes, definitely. Hi. Thank you, Christos. Uh, well, in here, it's it's... It's very particular because the, the, the critics uh, published by the government at the beginning of the crisis 
stated that it, it was uh, the, the move, the, the, the stop or the closure of everything was due to a uh, force majeure related to a disease. So everything was crazy in that effect, in the, in the matter that it was either one or the other, but they kind of uh, put the umbrella or the force majeure uh, on top of it, changing everything we all expected it to be regarding wages, regarding how you suspend things, regarding how you can react towards the client. So in that matter, uh, it was very clear that what uh, the government was trying to do, and, and I actually kind of understand what, 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 what is behind it, but what the government was trying to do is no layoffs, and you have to keep pay paying intact wages. So that's kind of complicated because it doesn't allow you to come to an understanding or an agreement with the different uh, employees in order to, if you, if maybe not paying the whole wage, pay a, a percentage of it, which allows him to ha or him or her to have an income, but also allows you to handle this uh, crisis uh, with more flexibility. So in Mexico, what they did was call it force majeure. So that changes or, or not, well, it changes what we expected because we have certain regulations for a pandemic and certain regulations for force majeure. So uh, in that sense, it was a slight uh, change of how we expected it to be. And it's been difficult for, for a lot of companies, um, even though people cannot lay off employees, companies have shut down. So that's, that's not the big issue with it. They didn't allow the, 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 the businesses to come into an agreement or understanding with their employees to have more longevity. So that's, that's what happened here. Thank you, Hector. Roberto, may I ask uh, the same for you, please, to add to this uh, discussion? Thank you, Christos. I, I would, if I think I, I agree with Hector, I, I, I would rather go to uh, try to respond what you put on the on the chat, if you don't mind, uh, because it's much more related what with what I have presented. I, I think that uh, <clears throat> you mentioned, uh, uh, well, Patrick uh, asked that about redundancy, if the message uh, I tried was going to trying to to send this that authorities would like uh, would have liked to close more roads but did not because there was not enough redundancy uh, no i think uh, <clears throat> no local authorities uh, uh, are worried about the disease control and uh, mostly in in many cases uh, especially in those who have restricted further the circulations on on their uh, uh, jurisdiction on their area. Uh, sometimes, even if the road is not managed by them, but it's in their territory. So, um, uh, what uh, I try to present is how these kind of decisions would affect because the lack of redundancy sometimes. So, of course, this is something that has been taken account in the in the road development uh, programs and investments for the future in Mexico. Uh, uh, because, of course, the disease is a, a good enough reason to avoid uh, the contagious uh, processes and they have all the right to restrict uh, circulation. But uh, the reasons could be others in the future. Uh, and for security uh, reasons, we should think about uh, greater redundancy, of course. So uh, yeah, I think this is, this is a pending issue for the, for the future to how to identify projects which are not merely uh, uh, responding to a current uh, demand, uh, very high traffic, for instance, between two cities, but they should also look to other uh, development uh, strategies and other reasons. No, uh, this is uh, what I would uh, respond to uh, to Patrick uh, and also you and himself 
a comment that the maps uh, showed a correlation between roads and the virus. Of course, transportation is the vehicle of spreading uh, pandemias and epidemias on cities, on, on, in countries. Uh, we know that. And the air transportation was the first vector, the first vehicle to, to connect uh, the virus. So uh, uh, all this would affect, this is the worldwide experience would affect heavily how we travel, uh, either with private vehicles, land transport vehicles, or with public transport vehicles in any, by any uh, means of transportation, air, sea, land, uh, either road or rail. So, uh, uh, of course, uh, that would be a very big challenge for the users of road infrastructure and of every kind of transport infrastructure, and also for authorities, uh, for economic agents, how to deal with economic feasibility and financial viability if people start to demand for lower density traveling, lower density vehicles, and of course, that would imply higher prices of transportation. And we will see, I think, in the future, much less traveling and uh, maybe much less willing of the public to invest in transport, interurban transport infrastructure because of this. So we have a lot of challenges to think about. Indeed, we do, uh, we do, Roberto. Thank you very much. Uh, and uh, this is part of uh, the reason we are having these webinars, in that mm -hmm. we recognize that uh, um, you know transport administrations and uh, road authorities uh, are going to be facing a lot of uh, new challenges ahead. Um, and uh, learning together is one of the ways to really, um, you know, help each other, you know, frame the future. And with that, I'm going to ask uh, Hong Bing, because uh, they bear the brand of this and they have a lot of experience. What measures implemented in transportation in Wuhan during the pandemic arrive to stay for the future? Hong Bing? Yeah, um, I... Right. So your question again, in the future? Uh, from the measures that you implemented, transportation measures, um, during the pandemic in Wuhan, which ones do you see that they have arrived and they are going to stay for the future as well? Right. Um, really, I, I, I don't know. I mean, this is the first thing for us. It's uh, so severe. And uh, all these measures, they are, they are uh, just give me the impression that uh, it, it keep on changing uh, since the totally blockage and, uh, and coming to nowadays uh, the gradual, uh, gradual how does it resume resumption, the public traffic, uh, the subway has so, uh, so fully opened. Uh, the buses uh, we have to keep distances. I mean the seats we have to seats. Uh, uh, to, to keep seats, uh, just, just uh, um, uh, how does it keep a social distance, uh, take buses. And uh, this uh, cold, this green cold thing, I'm not quite sure. I think unless this uh, pandemic is totally gone, this will be uh, required for a certain uh, relatively long period of time. And uh, uh, what? so for now that uh, private uh, um, the cars will be very convenient because uh, you can avoid public uh, gathering. And, uh, but then not everyone has uh, cars, so you need the public traffic. Then, then what to do? I mean, um, <laughs> I, I, I don't know. Just, this is so much that come to my mind. Yeah, and uh, relative to that, um, you know, to the code that you mentioned, the, uh, the green card, uh, what do you see, uh, you work with uh, Saverio on cybersecurity, uh, what do you see as some of the problems with cyber attacks uh, with the use of the technology for the green cards? Right, this, um, this is cybersecurity. Um, you know, initially I heard this uh, from our chairman uh, from their meeting note, uh, the, 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 the meeting note, really. I haven't uh, uh, deeply thought about this uh, 
uh, matter of this issue. Uh, but then, um, you know, after this couple of months, I start to think it's really uh, uh, because it's, it's connected to my daily daily work, my daily life. Uh, regarding the work from working at home, the, the most of us are doing this. And for me, for example, this cyber meeting, now we're using Zoom. Uh, this software is working fine, it's working good with me. But then I, I also worked for ICE, uh, a, a bridge magazine, uh, as an uh, as a, as a, uh, advisory uh, uh, panel member. But they always have meeting with, uh, uh, with Skype. I never worked, uh, you know, successfully uh, with cyber meeting with Skype. I don't know. So, for example, the software thing. And uh, uh, these are two international ones. And uh, speaking of a local one, I also tried several because different agencies, they may use different softwares. And that means you have to understand how this works. And, uh, you know, uh, to share screens, uh, it's, it's a lot of things. You have to be a skilled man for, for this uh, uh, internet. And uh, um, this is my daily uh, work thing, for example, a risk. This is a cyber. And uh, uh, for the life, for example, I mentioned with my parents, uh, they, are, they are in the age of 83, 84, and they never use, um, make full use of the smart mobile phone. So uh, I never tried to install these uh, softwares for them. But then without those softwares, it will be difficult to, to apply for this uh, uh, green code. Then they had to learn it. But then I, I, that means I have to install this software for them and teach them how to use it, how to avoid the possible uh, cyber phishing, for example. That's, that could be a, a risk. That's related to, all, all related to my daily, uh, daily lives. Uh, working, whether it's working or, or life. And I believe, you know, I, I'm working as a contractor, as a construction. If you ask about uh, the transporter, uh, the or administrator of the road, I believe they all have different uh, ideas, uh, you know, for different uh, cyber security things. So it's a very wide, uh, very wide thing. And, uh, and now it's an uh, internet of things. So everything's connected. Uh, then that makes it uh, even more uh, a bigger uh, problem. So everything has two sides. So this is the second side, the bad side is what we need to take care. So this is what I'm thinking. Thank you. Thank you, Hong Bing. Um, Hector, the uh, next question is uh, to you relative to road safety and what has been the impact on the roads that your company manage? Uh, and are you prepared for other impacts such as extreme rains and floods? <laughs> well, um, if, if it's uh, related to the actual crisis, fortunately, the, the accidents and those kind of things have been reduced, but basically they have been reduced due to the fact that the, the traffic has been reduced. So um, regarding the, the other part of the question, which is, uh, are we prepared for floods or floods or anything else? Well, we, 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 you have to take into account that we live in a, in a country with a, a lot of seismic activity. Uh, so that's all already uh, taken care of with the, within the design. And what we've done since uh, the last three years, um, actually it was a recommendation by Saverio, uh, we started doing a study in all of our roads to see the different possibilities that can happen or to have a plan of a resilience plan in, in case uh, a part of the infrastructure fails or is destroyed or something happens to it that actually does not allow us to keep on with the normal transit. So in that sense, what we have uh, developed are alternate routes. If, uh, if a bridge basically, which uh, the, the main thing would be a bridge, uh, that's the, the, the most difficult thing that we can uh, manage because at least in our roads, we don't have tunnels. Um, if a bridge, if, if a bridge has a problem or is uh, simply inusable, we have alternative plans to divert traffic. And even though it might take them a little bit longer or a lot longer, the the the, the, the flow of traffic isn't uh, suspended. So that's a that's a that's a plan we 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 did or we began doing it some years ago, basically three. And it's just a, a, a study or a research of the whole road 
to see which are the points that you can't live without them and thinking or or yeah thinking or conceiving that you won't have them what have what could you do so we have a plan or a, an alternate alternate route for each critical point thank you so much hector and dennis the next uh a question that we have is for you and it's relative to if you can tell us a little bit please about the um, Malaysian COVID-19 Act and if authorities are ready to embrace uh, the change. Uh, I think the, I covered a little bit of the act earlier on when I talked about the force majeure issue and why because of the various or the differing interpretation on whether or not COVID-19 is a force pleasure, the need for the act, whether we'll do it is, an, is another issue. Uh, but in terms of the authorities' uh, reaction to this, I uh, think we can commend the Malaysian government in uh, how they have reacted to the crisis. I think I've shown to you the very phased approach that we did, uh, quite a uniform approach. Um, it's forever evolving, it's forever changing, so they are being proactive to, to deal with the changes. And there are going to be new challenges coming along, and we're going to have to, to address them as they come along. Uh, for instance, social distancing is working at the moment now in public transport, but that's because demand is low. You know, in the next literally weeks, so very, very soon, public transport is going to increase significantly. So we're going to have to see how to manage social distancing in those areas. And what I can say is uh, the Malaysian government have been quite proactive in trying as best they can to deal with issues as they arise. Of course, there will always be a debate. Did they do too much or too little? And, and no one will know for sure. But at least we acted with resolve and in one direction. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dennis. Um, we also have one more question so to you relative to um, the experience in, Manage, in Malaysia and it's uh, relative to the widespread, uh, is there widespread testing of workers around the construction sites and how do you deal with the infection clusters around the, the sites? Okay, um, let's talk about testing in general first. So we're doing about 16,000 tests a day uh, in the country, and we hope to increase that to about 22,000 tests a day uh, in the next couple of weeks. So in, uh, that's not as high as in some developed countries, but it's really the third highest in the nation. Uh, in terms of type of testing, we've strictly followed WHO guidelines, and all the results are published uh, 12 p.m. daily by Ministry of Health. So great transparency uh, in this. Also, it's targeted testing. So there's certain countries where if you have a flu or cold, they just say, go home, they don't test you. If anyone is at all suspected of having uh, COVID, if you just show flu-like symptoms, you are uh, uh, asked to be tested. So there is a real effort to try to get to the correct, correct figure. Let's start with that. Okay. Now, um, recently, there's been a guideline that no one can start work before they are tested. So all the workers have to go for COVID testing. Uh, as I mentioned earlier in my talk, there is free government testing for nationals, but there's a long queue for that. So for the contractors, they have to wait, uh, decide whether it's better to wait for the free testing, which costs 100 US dollars, or to start work and pay for the test themselves. And by and large, what we're finding is that most contractors are just paying for the test to be done themselves so that they can start work uh, immediately. Uh, so in this way, we're trying to avoid clusters happening uh, at construction sites. Uh, where uh, in the previous cases where we already have had uh, clusters happening at construction sites, uh, it's an immediate uh, shutdown of that site. Uh, it's called an enhanced uh, movement control order area. So they literally put barbed wire around that, uh, those areas and people are not allowed to come in and out except for emergency services and of course the supply of essentials. Uh, and then within those, area, uh, within those enhanced uh, movement control order areas, uh, we, we also make sure there is social distancing kept. 
uh, and everyone in there goes for mandatory testing and it's not lifted till uh, everyone is cleared from mandatory testing and the cases drop in those areas. Um, thank you so much, Dennis. And uh, we'd like to save one question that we ask all of our panelists that, um, you know, spurs a little bit of discussion. So our next question, uh, um, it's going to go to everyone. We'll start uh, with uh, Hong Bing and uh, uh, it is, if workers go disperse, is there a loss of skills and how is that handled? Uh, could, uh, the question again, please. If workers go dispersed, do you experience a loss of skills with the workers living? And how would you handle that? Uh, dispersed, do you mean they're living, right? Correct. Uh, if skilled labor are living, what do we do? So this is the question. Yes, please. <laughs> right. Um, I in in so we, we, we got 148 projects and the most are in China. Uh, in China, I think the problem will be less worse because uh, you know, so resources, human resources is uh, enough for you to choose. And uh, um, but for our overseas projects, uh, this will be a, yes, this will be a, a a problem that we should seriously handle. Um, then. How if, if if I'm if I'm the, the the project manager, then what I will do? Um, right, what I will do then then uh, just just to how to say um, then this will have a big influence on the project if it, if they, they these skills are very important for the project. Then I'll I'll try my best. I mean to to leave them. Uh, there's several things you can have. Uh, this is what we learn from the management skills, uh, wedges or, or feelings uh, or uh, organizations or uh, you know friends relationship. So all these things are, are you know this might help uh, for you to handle this uh, uh, problem. And um, what 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 else? I I no I I. I don't know yet. <laughs> this is just something come to my mind. If I have understand your question correctly. Yeah. No, thank you. Uh, you, you did. Uh, Roberto, I'll ask you the same question, please. As we see some, uh, the loss of some workers, you know, um, and as they disperse around, do you see a loss of skills and uh, how do you handle it? Well, that's really... Uh, <laughs> a mystery that we have to be <clears throat> resolving. <clears throat> I think uh, the need for work is such that uh, I don't think there will be a, a, a loss. Well, we could think about two kinds of losses. No, people that return to the original towns that would rather not uh, go uh, again to the the cities where they used to have the, the job and they would change activities and people who died because of the virus. And uh, for the rest of the cases, I think uh, the labor market is uh, resilient enough and the need will help that the gaps will be filled, that positions will be filled uh, with people in the need for job. I, I mean, there are, there are, uh, there is still in Mexico a lot of of uh, poverty and a lot of need for for work. People uh, are willing, and there are uh, lots of uh, programs going on for uh, developing the skills needed to work in public works. So I, I think. Uh, this would not have a very high impact on either productivity uh, or uh, availability of, of uh, labor force for the public works. Thank you so much, Roberto. <clears throat> Hector, may I also ask the same question to you, please? 
Yes, Christos. Well, uh, if, if it's related to the loss of skills of these person workers during this crisis. Correct. I, and, I would whether say, you, and if you really get it back after that, you know, or yeah. how, do you, how do you handle it? How do you plan around it? I would say, well, first of all, the skills will be there. I mean, the people would be there. So second of all, how do we handle it? Uh, I can tell you that regarding the operation as well as construction of infrastructure, what we have done when our projects in this crisis have been suspended is we keep them under contract. So it, by doing so and paying, pay, pay, paying, the, the, paying them their wages, by doing so, we don't have a loss of skills. People are already there. And when uh, nowadays, all of our projects have been reinstated. So the thing is, we just need to bring people back. So it's again a matter of being in contact with everyone. And, uh, 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 and by doing so, we haven't got any, any loss of skills as a company. Fortunately, <clears throat> the country doesn't lose the skills unless people die. And that's why we have to take care of them. But in any, in any other situation, it would be as a, as a normal activity in the sense that if you lay some worker, everyone, I know everyone, someone will take him. However, the thing is that in this crisis, the first thing that was that, that, that the first industry that got hit it or got a, got, a, got a knockout was the construction industry. And that, at least here in Mexico, uh, employs a huge amount of people that have only those skills and, cannot do it and, and won't do anything else. So um, the important thing is to take care of them in order not to actually lose the skills as a country. As a company, you will, get, you will definitely get them <clears throat> either, by the, either on the ones that you already know or new ones. But uh, the important thing is, to not, is not to lose the skills as a country. Thank you, Hector. Dennis? Oh, Christoph, yes. I think when you talk about dispersal of workers, there's the immediate problem. And uh, the immediate problem is not really one of loss of skills, but the human, humanity problem. So we have people which are hunger, hungry and homeless. So that's as immediate thing is what we have to deal with first. And there we have some very uh, heartwarming stories about how subcons are not able to pay or house their workers and main cons adopting these workers and housing them and feeding them and giving them a little bit of money to send home because it's not just hunger for them, but hunger for their uh, families back in whatever home countries they are. So I think uh, when we talk about displaced workers, it's an immediate problem we have to deal with first. The loss of skills, I think, is part of a bigger problem. And what we're pushing for, really, even before COVID, but very much because of COVID, is for less labor intensive methods of construction. Uh, so for instance, we're driving very hard for the adoption of modular building systems, where essentially complete units are built in a factory, including tiling, including uh, windows, including electricals and plumbing and all that, and then just taken to site and just bolted on at site. So in terms of site activity, uh, it's very, very much less. So I think um, we should be pushing for those new skills rather than focusing on loss of the old skills. Um, Christos, will there be a chance for us to do closing remarks as well, or should I do mine now? Um, we really haven't done it in the past, but uh, you know, uh, you know, please go ahead. Okay. So really, Christos and Patrick and Pia, thank you very much for this uh, sharing session. I think most of us in the world haven't come across a pandemic, an issue like this before. So you can either say we are reinventing the wheel every day or we're just making it up as we go along. So it's very important that across the world we can share our experiences so that we can come together as humanity to fight this problem together. Um, on our part, we've done a lot of work on this. We've got a lot of advisory work, not just the slides that we presented, but also we have a lot of guidelines which we produce, which we disseminate free to the industry players. Uh, if you'd like that information, you can write to me at uh, dennisg, D-E-N-N-I-S-G, at minkonsult.com, and we freely share this information with you. 
uh, we don't charge anything for it. Uh, but I do think I might charge Patrick a nice bottle of Cabernet Sauvignon next time I'm in Paris for agreeing to do this. Thank you. I think, uh, Dennis, thank you very much. I think we all, uh, all of our panelists throughout the webinars that uh, uh, we have held the last, um, you know, uh, two months now since, uh, you know, the, since uh, the middle of March, um, really a lot of gratitude for coming here and sharing their ideas. And having discussions like this is really what help us uh, hone into the next subject that we should focus and uh, have a webinar. Um, with that, um, I would like to um, thank all of our presenters for the excellent material that they shared with us today. And in closing, turn it over to Patrick with one last question relative to what else is PR planning relative to uh, response? Thank you very much, Christos. And Dennis, we will send our bill for the promotion opportunity. So this is really a, a joint operation. Thank you to all our panelists. It was really, really great. Uh, the usual words of caution, caution apply. Uh, of course, you've heard them before. Uh, and the next steps is the video recording and the presentations will be shared on our website. Uh, we are planning future webinars in English, certainly uh, Spanish and French, uh, hopefully as well. Uh, we will publish a second note. Uh, the first one is already available from our website and we are uh, uh, putting the final touch to a second note uh, with the findings from our webinars. You can find that on our uh, website uh, here. And uh, I'm starting to think that uh, we are reaching a, a, well, a, a stage where we can see that we need to think very carefully about the future. And uh, this is why uh, the webinar next week if everything goes according to plan, of course, but the, the webinar next week will focus on planning and on funding uh, issues. So how are countries handling those, uh, uh, those questions? Uh, well, I hope uh, we will be able to send you the uh, draft agenda uh, very, very soon. Uh, we have also set up, thanks to our colleague Valentina uh, in Italy, uh, set up two polls that you're all invited to join and the links are also available from our website. So please don't rush and take uh, and note down all these uh, complex addresses. The first one is to help us identify issues of concern. So if you have a question, if you have an issue of concern, please enter that on the first form so that we, uh, this informs our work in the future. And the second one is if to identify stakeholders who would like to share their experience in future webinars. Uh, please let us know, of course, we're always looking for people who are eager to share their experience and their ideas uh, as efficiently as our four panelists have done today. Having said that, thank you very much to the response team, uh, to our colleagues, their email addresses are here on the screen now. And uh, well, thank you to all our audience members. Uh, the audience has stayed strong throughout the uh, two hour and 20 minutes of the webinar. Thank you very much to everyone. Stay safe. And uh, I'm looking forward to working with you again. Bye everyone. Thank you. And this is the end of our webinar today. Thank you, Christos. Thank you everyone. Have a great day ahead.